It's Taj of the And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, a show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher, and this, of course, is All the Above, a show that's all about education. Shout out to our new viewers and our new listeners. If you found us on educationalpodcastdirectory.com, then I'm glad you you came across us. Um, If you haven't checked it out yet, if you are into education podcasts, educationalpodcastdirectory.com, put up by uh, Jeff Bradbury. Whole lot of cool podcasts up there. Of course, all of the above is a webcast also. So head over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash all of the above to see all of our episodes. I edit most of the episode and I think the graphics are kind of dope. So check us out if you haven't already and subscribe while you are there. All right, Jeff, what's on the agenda for today's episode? Well, Manuel, uh, as per usual, we got a good one for people today. I think uh, folks are gonna find this intriguing and timely. Uh, so a subject that is very near and dear to the hearts of uh, really of most people, I think, uh, Mm -hmm. and certainly most families is the topic of reading. And, uh, you know, in this day and age when kids spend so much time on cell phones and tablets and Chromebooks and all that good stuff, right? Uh, what does that mean in terms of creating a culture of reading and a culture of literacy in our Mm. schools? Uh, Mm. And we have a fantastic guest. Uh, Many of you will recognize her because she's been with us before. Uh, Genevieve Dubose Akinagbe, who's going to be here with us to help us unpack this interesting topic. So you definitely don't want to miss it. Stick around, folks. All right. Up first is our Do Now, where we take a look at recent headlines in education. All right. Now it's time for the Do Now. Jeff, how are we doing the Do Now today? Well, Manuel, uh, you know, the main topic for today's episode is uh, about reading and about Mm -hmm. literacy. So it is only fitting that we have a lexicon today, Manuel. We're going to get into one of the five core elements of literacy, which is vocabulary. Nice. Breaking it down. Breaking it down. All right, Jeff. So what's the first lexicon term for today? All right, Manuel. First term for today is one of my personal favorite words and mm. I want you to say it this way with me folks it's ignorant oh not ignorant. Ig- not ignorant 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 yes <laughs> all right that's that's the serious level of of ignorance when you just say ignorant yes yeah it has that little bit of outrage and indignation yeah. that oh, I, yeah. I just I find comforting to my soul nice all right so what's ignorant in this case well um and well uh we're talking about ignorant today as in you might wind up being ignorant um if you mess with uh learning from this particular social studies curriculum uh, that is shared in many states across the country uh so in a recent review uh from this national social studies curriculum called studies weekly uh they revealed more than 400 examples of racial or ethnic bias contained within their curriculum um this also included things like historical inaccuracies age inappropriate content and other errors uh now for those who may not know studies weekly is a utah-based company and it produces kind of an interesting model of uh k-8 to social studies curriculum they also do produce uh k-5 to science curriculum as well um, and their curriculum is used by 13,000 schools serving about 4.3 million students across the country um, Now, uh, unlike most curriculum, which many people probably remember, you know, having a textbook, this big, thick, heavy brick that you got to, you know, lug on your back to and from school every day or that sort of thing. Studies Weekly actually takes the approach of providing a newspaper like publication for every student um, on a weekly basis. And it's very colorful and, you know, engaging with lots of charts and graphs and stories and, you know, uh, tries to make history. Sounds great, right? Tries to make history come alive. Um, They also include an online library of videos and other primary source materials. So, um, so Studies Weekly, uh, had in 2018 a diversity board that they convened which was made up of uh, administrators and professors and other educators uh, who conducted this review and found 
um, these many hundreds of errors uh, and made recommendations to the company to make changes. So Manuel, um, what, are you, what are you thinking about here? Yeah, so um, not surprised. Yeah. Um, so this is social science curriculum that we're talking about here. And as a social science teacher, um, and you don't even have to be a social science teacher to know the power of, of that content and how it's delivered and, and what's covered. And this particular set of curriculum had a lot of problems within it, especially in relation to how they spoke about black Americans and how they spoke about um, indigenous peoples. Um, one example is that um, indigenous people were often referred to as quote unquote troublemakers. And there were tasks that asked students to imagine being a plantation owner. And there's an article in there describing Africans brought to Jamestown to work tobacco fields without pay. Um, it describes that situation as, is it wasn't wonderful, but it was better than being a slave. Mm. So this is what happens when you have white centered curriculum that is completely devoid of any input from um, indigenous peoples, black uh, Americans, educators of color. This is the standard whitewash American history curriculum that has existed for ever. But in recent years, it's been called out quite a bit more um, than, you, than previously as more educators have spoken up and as more people have spoken up about this. So um, the article where this uh, story broke in, in Education Weekly um, showed a screenshot of a parent's response on one of the assignments. And it was a task where the student was asked to think about um, slavery from the perspective of a plantation owner who relied on that. Uh, labor and to, I think, have a, some kind of comment about uh, why this labor was needed or something like that. And the parent wrote back, although I, I encourage my students to be a critical thinker, we do not condone, support or condone slavery. And um, more incidents like that have, have hit the news recently in the social media era, uh, more you know, screenshots and posts about trouble, uh, troubling curriculum. Um, getting home and parents being like, oh, hell no, nah, this, yeah. this isn't flying. And this isn't a surprise to me that we still have this type of uh, whitewashed, mediocre curriculum out there. What is a surprise is that um, the CEO of this organization, um, John McCurdy, said that um, a lot of it just comes down to changes in acceptable language and political correctness, um, which is completely, uh, just complete slap in the face um, to, to marginalized peoples to call this uh, a matter of political correctness versus actually including uh, those voices in the curriculum. Yeah, I 100% agree. The, the article with the, uh, the picture of the parents' response written on yeah. the, the student's homework assignment, I was like, yeah, you go ahead, mom. Yeah. Like, tell them. Because, I mean, it's just, it's just yeah. like unacceptable on so many levels, right? Uh, it's, it's, I, I will say, as a social studies teacher, I found it to be a little bit of a stupid task to begin with. Like, right. imagine what it would feel like to be this. I, I just find those sorts of prompts to be like, particularly not very rigorous and not very yeah. interesting. Uh, and then to ask young people, this was, I think, a fifth grade assignment, mm -hmm. um, to you know consider the emotional plight of the plantation owners who might lose all their free labor uh, is, is as backwards as we yeah. all think it is, right? So uh, I, I fully agree with that. I also think, um, so I went to the company's website, right? Okay. And, you know, it, they've got an interesting product. There's a lot of innovative curriculum products nowadays, and it seems like it could be a great thing. But they have a nice promotional video showing uh, the CEO, showing people working in the office. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know, that, that video does not contain a single human being who's not white dude really? i mean it was i was like color me just, shocked it is just an embodiment of exactly the room full of people that you might right. imagine would have created this this type of curriculum now was it those individuals fault who knows uh were those people paid actors who knows but uh you know i think it yeah. speaks volumes to the fact that we are living in a, in a day and age where our country is more diverse than ever we're living in a day and age where we have so much access to information. There's no excuse yeah. for just ignorant, racist, foolish curriculum like this, um, making its way through editorial cycles and all this stuff to get in yeah. the hands of kids. Uh, it's unacceptable. And so, you know, I don't know. They did initiate this self-review to discover these things. So maybe there's some, some credit due there. But, mm. um, you know, it raises huge questions for me about, like, who's writing this stuff and what is the process by which this can get approved.
Yeah, this is what happens when you convene a diversity board in you know, the 11th hour to take a look at your stuff, when you've been completely devoid of, of inclusion of any, any marginalized groups, anybody besides you know, white, and I'm assuming uh, largely men in this, in this group uh, writing this curriculum. When you wait to the 11th hour and convene a diversity board to do a review, you're gonna find all these problems because um, that's what happens when you have a very one-sided view of history and you don't do the, the minimalist of things and reach out to people um, from outside your own sphere to, to be part of a project that's uh, serving over four million students, like over four million students being exposed yep. to this this uh, problematic, um, harmful curriculum. That's just, I mean, it, it it it's one reason why I'm not so surprised about back in June when they had those uh, reparations um, hearings in, in Congress and, and all the ignorance that came out of people's reactions to those. It's like a lot of people have grown up with a very skewed sense of uh, American history and slavery's place in American history and curriculum like this is is part of the reason why. Yeah, so. yeah, hundred percent agree. Ignit, 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 ignit. How you wind up with the nation's capital having a football team called a racial slur that we will right. not say on this yeah. uh, on this show. Ignit. But uh, you start teaching people in fourth grade that they were savages so, yeah. who gave up their land and this kind of thing. Right? Troublemakers. I mean, connect the dots, folks. Connect yeah. the dots. All right. All right, man. Well, what's up next? Next lexicon term for today is chasm. Chasm. I like that word. Chasm like, uh, you know, um, when you are climbing in the Alps and you have to get from one peak to another peak. Mm. And in between, there's a giant chasm. Probably. Um, I mean, I climb in the Alps personally all the yeah, time. Yeah, no, nah, I'm black. I don't non, do that non, sort of stuff. I, wow, why, why, I why, why you got to make it mad racial? <laughs> man, man. <laughs> uh, anyways. All right. So, Chasm, um, speaking of race, this story has, has to do with race. If you're tired of us talking about race, then um, you, you might be watching the wrong show because race is intertwined <laughs> to our educational experience in America and schooling in America. And in this case, we're looking at the chasm between graduation rates for Latinx students, uh, Latinx college students as compared to other racial groups. A recent Heckinger report notes that as the number of Latinx students skyrockets in American colleges and universities, many institutions are struggling to provide the services and supports that Latinx students need. Between the year 2000 and 2015, the number of Latinx college students more than doubled to 3 million. Between 1996 and 2016, their share of the overall college enrollment rose from 8 to 19 percent, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Despite their growth in size, Latinx students are still less likely than their peers, even other low-income or underrepresented minority groups, to actually attain a degree. In the year 2016, the Education Trust reported that just 22.6 percent of Latinx people aged 25 to 64 had any form of college degree, compared to 30.8 percent of Black Americans and 47 point one percent of white Americans so Jeff what do you what do you think about this growing number of Latinx students in college but this divide between their college graduation rates and the college graduation rates of other racial minority groups yeah so I have a couple of thoughts I mean my, my honestly my first reaction when I read the statistics about the growth of Latinx students in college mm -hmm. I was I was surprised like I, I know there's a larger number of Latinx mm -hmm. people in America but I didn't realize that the growth had been at that pace right uh, you know because I certainly didn't experience that when I was in college and um, you know and I and so I thought wow this is uh, that's kind of a, a shocking high number and also yeah. great glad glad you know glad to see this type of growth right that um, students are uh, finding their way to college and finding their way to success. Then, of course, the the data becomes a little more sobering yeah. <laughs> when, when you realize that you know close to eight out of ten uh, Latinx students are not going to finish right. uh, college, um, even if they go. Uh, you know, certainly gives you uh, some pause, right? And so, I guess to me, I saw a lot of parallels in what the the Heckinger report piece talked about and a few mm -hmm. other related articles talked about in terms of uh, kind of the arc of universities getting better at supporting particular communities, right? right? And so the things they're talking about needing to do, hire more diverse faculty. So there's some representation of, yeah. you know, from that community. Um, 
you know, providing services on campus, uh, you know, social programming and affinity groups, providing mentoring and, you know, those sorts of services that specifically are targeted at supporting a group that uh, maybe does not necessarily have a strong foothold in the universities or the, the posters and paintings on the wall don't yet yeah. reflect their community. You know, the names of all the halls and the libraries in the school, you know, don't yet reflect that it is their space too. And so uh, I, it, it struck me as like a similar arc that I think our universities have undergone in serving black students, at serving yeah. women, at serving LGBT students, right? Which is not to say that those arcs are, are finished uh, Far at this from point, it. but perhaps there's actually been a little more uh, movement given that the numbers in those communities have been around for a, a longer period of time. So yeah, um, yeah I, I think those were kind of my two, two initial thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my takeaways is, I mean, uh, obviously the demographics of our uh, country are changing as they've always been changing since since the beginning. Um, and there are you know, I didn't realize this until later in my teaching career that there are institutions that have been uh, categorized as Hispanic serving institutions um, based on the number of Latinx students that they have there. Um, however, a lot of these institutions don't really receive much more funding, if at all, to, to serve this population and do anything about the fact that they are an institution with, uh, with a high population of Latinx students. Um, I think this, you know, like all racial groups, this is not a monolithic group that we're talking about. So this isn't simply about um, being low income. It's not simply about um, any particular uh, any particular category. It's just the, the like you said, the bigger picture of the combination of factors from the universities not having uh, groups, any affinity groups or anything to, to, to support you or, or make you feel that you actually do have space in that in that university to the names on the buildings, to the whitewashed curriculum, which we referred to in our last story uh, revol uh, involving K-12 curriculum, um, all that, all that combination of factors. And then, of course, there's cultural factors in, in some families. I know I've had students, uh, Latinx students, who've, who've gone off to college and, and felt a lot of pressure from the family to, to still live at home, even though mm -hmm. they were in college. So even if the college is on the other side of the city, um, the pressure from their families to know you're supposed to stay at home, especially for uh, some of my uh, female students. So um, that, that cultural dynamic is, is also in play for, for some folks within this group. There's, there's a lot of things in play. Um, if anything, I think this shows that we together have to, have to do more to think about how colleges serve this group, but also everybody in the sense of colleges breaking away from their tradition of being uh, white-centered institutions um, and, and being accepting to, to all groups and being designed to support groups who may not be coming from uh, backgrounds for whom college has always been part of their part of their plans or college has always been part of their family history. Yeah. Yeah, I, what also stood out to me, uh, as you mentioned, was this, this designation of uh, being a Hispanic serving institution. Right. So I had always, I've heard that term and yeah. I have always thought that it had like some that it meant Some, something. Yeah, like you had to it, earn yeah. it or there was some kind of cool like right. prize you like got. Like based or, on the, what yeah, you've like been you doing for Yeah, like you had to have it together, group. right? Yeah. Like, you know, you, if you get a driver's license, and yeah. you had to prove you can drive. Or if you, right, right. you know, got a trophy in the, in the yeah. race, you probably came in first or something. But uh, the, the actual reality is that in order to be designated a Hispanic serving institution, a school really just needs to be like a, a real school. So it yeah. can't be like that for-profit online college that's got yeah. signs on the subway that you that you see every day it's got to be like a real school and has to be 25 percent or more uh, right. latinx students right and so that's that's really it just right? having um, them in your population just team. having them yeah. there right now in theory the the purpose of this designation was to open up qualification for additional grants from the u.s department of education right. um, and uh, as many conversations on this show do uh, it circles back to um the, the number one hater of all the above in the entire United States. Don't say her name, Secretary Jay. of Education, Betsy DeVos. I How see you, Betsy, with the thumbs name. down on YouTube. Um, although she's taken a couple couple months off now recently. Now she's going to go back to the, the videos that she missed. Oh, uh, okay. She's going to hit it up. <laughs> she's Dang. just been busy. she got to get caught up. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but frankly, the funding for Hispanic serving institutions has not kept pace with the growth in right. numbers of those institutions and the rapid growth of Latinx students in, in college and on college campuses. And so uh, yet another um, layer to the fact that we need additional resources to help ensure that this very important aspect of, of public education in this country right. is actually meeting the needs of the students that, that it's supposed to. Indeed.
All right, one last term. All right, here we go, man. Well, this, what do we have? This, you know, I liked, I liked ignorant. Ignorant was a good word. Ignorant was pretty uh, good. This, this might actually be my favorite word of the day, though, man. Well, mm. uh, this word is brouhaha. Brouhaha. Yes. Oh wow, <laughs> that's like that's in the arena of a kerfuffle. That's serious. That man. is yes. You don't it just is. throw that word around lightly. I, it's kerfuffle ish. Wow. I was trying to step up to match your game, man. That's I just I felt pressure. I feel like I came through. Brouhaha. Man. Yeah. All right. What's going on? This uh, clearly is something big, then. All right. So brouhaha today, as in there's some brouhaha happening in all the Twitterverse over the new College Board adversity index or so-called adversity index so i'm guessing that many of our viewers might have heard about this because people are all up in their feelings in social media yeah. talking about affirmative action and this and that so we're going to get into this story a little bit and uh and share some some facts because we like facts here and all we the above. love facts on all the above. we do so controversy abounds of course as the college board is set to expand access to its environmental context dashboard which is the real name of this thing called the right. adversity index um and uh they are going to expand access to it theoretically to all colleges and universities next year they had been piloting it with uh, about 50 major universities from across the country um, this includes schools you've you've probably heard of places like yale uh, university of michigan florida state and trinity college is just a few examples now, critics allege that the dashboard uh, raises the score uh, or raises, excuse me, the sore spots of affirmative action in the whole college admissions uh, debate that has seen major conflicts between conservative and more progressive aspects of the field of education and also certainly in the courts over the last several decades. Um, however, contrary to many accounts on social media, the dashboard is not a single score. Um, it does not alter a student's SAT score in any way. And it is not intended to be used to either neatly sum up um, the entirety of a student's experience or to substitute for all the other aspects of their application. So your essays, your, you know, your resume, all that good stuff. Um, so, Manuel, um, this topic, big brouhaha. Big brouhaha. What, what do you think? College board is always behind some of the biggest brouhaha's in education. That's a fair That's statement, like what they do. <laughs> That's a fair statement. David Conley and the crew uh, not shying away from controversy. Nah. All right. So um, I thought long and hard about this, and I I just don't feel good about this mm. um, at all. I think we probably are going to disagree um, on this topic. So this diversity score to me uh, has a couple of problems. One of the main problems that um, it has, as far as I'm concerned is that it really misses the mark on the trouble with the SAT. So the SAT has a long fraught uh, history of um, just cultural bias and all, they've tinkered with the SAT, I don't know how many times, they went from 1600 to 2400 and back to 16 and now optional essay and all these different things to try to tinker with it to make it something that we feel could accurately measure college readiness. Clearly, it doesn't accurately measure college readiness. There's a story a year or two ago, a study that showed that um, GPA is a much better predictor for college readiness than SAT scores. Students with low GPAs but high SAT scores didn't do very well in college. Students with high GPAs and low SAT scores did much better. Um, and more and more and more universities and colleges across the country are going away from having the SAT be a uh, requirement to apply. Because the, the test itself is, is, is faulty. To me, the College Board is trying to keep the SAT relevant and trying to salvage it. And I just don't like it. To me, I, I never thought I'd see the day that somebody or some group, and I'm sure the people behind this really meant well, and I know that they uh, put their heart and soul into it because they believe in the SAT as being a very big, um, big factor in students' um, college outcomes. But um, to me, this is an attempt to quantify grit and try to put a number behind the amount of grit a student has. So based on the student's school and neighborhood context and the number of low income uh, people in that neighborhood and this and that, I'll, I forget how many factors they look at. They look at 16, oh, 16 factors. Mm -hmm. um, here's the number that we came up with to help you see their SAT scores in a different light. Um, grit itself is problematic in a lot of different ways because it sort of presumes that students um, need to just fight through and, and pull themselves up by their bootstraps to get over all the systemic inequities and this seems to be a way to show like oh this student only got a 
1,200, but look at their adversity score. They had to overcome a lot. That's some grit right there. Um, and that really ignores some of the bigger, uh, bigger issues and bigger problems. So if I am a admissions counselor, and you worked in admissions, so I'm looking forward to hearing what, what um, you think about the score. But if I'm in admissions and I'm looking at two students and one has a, a relatively low SAT score compared to the other, but the student's um, adversity score is, is really high, um, it's like, oh, the student only scored 1,200 something, but look at their adversity score, look at what they had to go through, um, and the student that scored 1,570 or 1,600 even, it's just like straight up like, wow, great job, but there's nothing in the adversity score to kind of take away points from that student for having the private tutor or for being at a school that has SAT prep uh, programs or licenses. Um, um, software for students to prep for the SAT. There's nothing to really take. So it goes back to sort of that deficit thinking of excuses for these students, but these students who are high achieving, like they just did that and we don't have to look closer into it. So there's a yeah. lot of lot of murky problems in there. Uh, what do you think? Well, so I would say first that in terms of the ideas that you just shared, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I particularly disagree with the spirit of your comments. I think where I disagree is like in the, in the practical reality of things, um, the SAT does exist and still the yes. overwhelming majority of colleges in the United States, four-year colleges in particular, require either the SAT or the ACT. And right. I don't see a foreseeable future where that's gonna change in any significant way. Almost all the schools that you're talking about that have moved away from the SAT requirement are either really small, fairly elite liberal arts colleges, mm -hmm. right? Or the like wealthier private colleges um, in the country. And frankly, a lot of the reason that they can move away from the SAT is they're only taking the very top slice yeah. uh, of students That's who fair. score on the SAT anyway. So what really is the difference between a 1420 and a 1450, right? right? Like, does that really say something substantive in the admissions process to you, that, that distinction, right? Um, but, you know, when you're dealing with students who are getting like a 900 versus a 1300, like I think they're actually, I'm not a person who believes the standardized tests are, are the boogeyman. Mm -hmm. I think we use them incorrectly in a lot of cases, but they are the most, uh, the most powerful means by which we have to make comparisons over really large population groups. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. Is the history of the SAT fraught with all kinds of problems? Absolutely, right? So I hear that argument. But in a world where the SAT is a requirement, and in a world where college admissions uh, officers and college admissions committees are sitting around and actually trying to do the work that this um, environmental context dashboard does in their, mm -hmm. in their conversations. When I was an admissions officer, part of what we did when we're looking at you know, two students who um, you know, come from radically different places, from a small town in rural New Hampshire and from Manhattan, right, um, who go to a school that offers 35 AP courses and all the kids take five or six of them before they graduate to a kid who goes to a school that doesn't offer any AP courses right. and has to go to like night school at the county community college to like get something that's more rigorous than just right. the only classes available, right? Um, how do you make comparisons across those two students? And if you are a human being and you don't know every community, uh, mm -hmm. you know, across the country, like all people, right? right. Um, I think the data that's captured in here is actually interesting data to consider. And uh, is it perfect? I'm sure not. But in a world where we want college admissions committees to be making contextualized decisions, what kind of opportunity does this student have? How impressive are their, is their track record relative to their peers in their right. school, right? Um, how much of the opportunity that was available to them did they take advantage of in terms of numbers of AP courses and those sorts of things? Um, and I thought, uh, and of course, this comes from the College Board website, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought what was really interesting is that on the website, they noted uh, in the pilot with these 50 universities that... Um, College admissions folks who participated said things like, it allowed us to rely less on stereotypes, assumptions, or incomplete data, and more on hard facts. Um, and it was valuable for students from non-feeder high schools. So that means, you know, schools that aren't just like the powerhouse high school that sends 100 kids to their college every year, right? right? Um, and areas that the college admissions officers are less familiar with. So I, I think it actually can be a lever for equity in the college admissions process that perhaps opens the door to more students who don't just um, come to the game already with lots of privilege. Will it play out that way? We'll see. 
Um, will it wind up being challenged by, you know, conservative white folks who feel entitled to every seat at Yale? We'll see. But uh, from my standpoint, I actually, I went into researching this feeling like, mm, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. And as I did now more research and looked at it, I said, this is the kind of thinking college admissions officers are already doing. It's the thinking that's behind, uh, even in states that don't have affirmative action, that, that um, you know, that say, well, if you're in the top 10% of your high school class, you get automatic admission to your flagship state university or a state university campus. That's the same type of calculus that is that is being just captured as data points right. um, in the dashboard. It's also interesting that it captures both a community uh, set of indicators and a school set of indicators, right? So it it's, does. it's trying to be nuanced in that way, which which I appreciate it. So we'll see what happens. But from my standpoint, it is not the the boogeyman uh, right. that I thought it was framed as. And to me, the brouhaha seems a little overblown. Nah, see, and obviously I pause any time I might find myself on the same side as, as conservative folks uh, by any measure. Um, but in this case, I mean, you know, from, from what I read about this, this we, I'm thinking about school. I think about students who move schools, you know, because a lot of my students uh, shift mm -hmm. around for various reasons. And um, for what I saw, they, they look at your last placement at time of application. And I have a lot of group home students. And there's a group home that's in a, a, a nicer area of the city. And I wonder what their index will look like if that is the neighborhood from which they are measured and students and counselors can't at least as of right now can't see their score so that's problematic in itself and to me if you have to do all this to try to make sense of a test score then maybe the problem is with the test period so when I think about education when I think about um, the, the grand purpose of it and me I'm trying to school for liberation to get everybody especially folks on the margins into a place where they feel that they could thrive and enjoy the best that life has to offer to me this is like keeping systems in place in this case the sat um that should have been ditched a long time ago and the more we keep them in place the more we set up ways to make sense of them then the longer is from my view of it the longer we just keep these mechanisms going and we never get to the root of the problem which is that all these measures all these attempts to try to quantify who is smart enough for college or best prepared for college um, just the more that we keep those going and the more damage we do to folks who are on the margins to me I'm fine with scores to, to measure sort of the, the opportunity available in different schools and districts um, in general but for the college board to be behind to be behind this index to take all these things into account for someone to, to think about when they look at this SAT score I mean we talked I think last season about the SAT and the potential for it to become a performance assessment um, down the line. Again, it's just all tinkering and trying all these different things to make it a meaningful score when research shows it's just not a meaningful score. So to me, I think this is like something that's going to handicap it and keep it going. So I would push back a little bit and say, uh, it, I don't think we've seen a body of research that says the SAT is, a, is completely not a meaningful score. Mm -hmm. They're like students who do well on the SAT are very highly correlated with succeeding in college. And students who do really poorly on the SAT also have strong data to show they're not prepared for four-year college work. The issue with the test is the vast middle, right? And mm -hmm. so I think that's where actually this kind of information is helpful where there is a really strong need to like consider data in context, the same way that you consider a student's essay, uh, you know, you look at um, their resume, right? Like some kids right. have a million and one activities, but that's because, you know, their parents hire them a private tutor and drive them around and pay for all these sports camps and things, right? And other kids are like home babysitting their siblings, right? Um, because that's the need of the family. We're already doing that with every other aspect of students' applications, apart from systems where the application is purely, you know, quantitative. If you get this number, this number, this number, right. you're in. Um, and I don't disagree that there are there are flaws in the system, but the system exists. It impacts tens of millions of young people across the country. We might as well make it better and more fair. So that that's kind of where I come to rest on it. This has been a long view now, but it's not done. Think about the story where um, I think it was seven or eight episodes ago. It was a while back. That story about. Uh, black and brown kids, black students actually specifically in suburban white schools, high performing schools, uh, being subject to all these uh, racial, not just microaggressions, but racism from teachers and their peers and being isolated from AP classes and this and that. Black and brown students are not monolithic groups and there's a lot of black and brown students out in the suburbs and who are more affluent, who are dealing with uh, systemic inequities in terms of race that also aren't measured here. So if I'm a black kid at a suburban school and my counselor didn't put me in the AP classes, uh, my teacher didn't, didn't 
care two cents about me and my adversity score shows that I'm like fine because my school context, my neighborhood context. So to completely ignore race is another thing. I understand they, they couldn't include race or they say they couldn't include race because there's so many states like California, um, which don't allow race to be a factor in consideration for college admissions. Um, but if I mean, if that's the case, I'm thinking about, well, how accurate is the score if it doesn't measure things like that? It doesn't measure, you know, discipline so disparities I, between I black kids and white kids. Like, I don't disagree with the spirit of your comment. I guess I would just say better. So than nothing? exactly. Nah, it, it, what's going to happen to that kid if there is no equity index? Right. To that kid in the suburbs whose yeah. teachers were racist? The, yes. The index, yeah. if anything, that's setting them back because no, they're, now no, they're no. looking if, like their score is good. Without, without this uh, equity, or this, excuse me, this environmental Did we call it an dashboard. equity index? It is not an equity index. Yeah, although I, I think, think it, it functions in a similar, it's a in grit a similar score. monitor. I'm going to call it a grit score. Or in a similar um, a similar way, by a similar mechanism. Mm -hmm. I would say the, the question I would ask is, what's happening to those students without this information, right? They're, they're going to be just compared to their peers uh, with conjecture and ideas in the minds of the admissions committee if they're at a school that screens individually that way. Um, if they're not, if they're applying to like a large state system where it's really just GPA, class rank, test scores, right? Mm -hmm. um, then so be it, right? It's six and one half dozen the other. But if they're applying to a school that does, you know, take into more, uh, take into consideration more of a nuanced set of criteria, I think this gives information to the, uh, to mm -hmm. the school that's useful. And I do definitely appreciate the group home example that you mm -hmm. gave. Um, I think there's probably like foster youth who would fall into that, right. into that same category. But the overwhelming majority, as we've talked about a thousand times on this show, of, of students uh, in this country live in economically segregated communities, right? right? So even if your school is located in a community, uh, you know, like New York City, where I spent most of my career is a perfect example of this. You mm -hmm. have, you know, school, high schools in really nice or gentrified areas of the city, but none of the kids come from there. All the kids come from the projects or from a lower income community, you right. know, a few miles away, right? And so um, this is gonna give admissions officers some information that helps explain that. Is it mm. perfect? No. But to me, I don't see how it makes the, the equation less fair to those students. If anything, I see it as making it perhaps a little bit more fair. Hmm. I think my score would have been a very poor measure because we lived in a not great area, me and my mom, single mother, um, but we lied about our address to go to a suburban school. So I believe my score would have shown that fraudulent address, um, which was a, a rental that we were in for like a couple months before we left. And so that neighborhood and that school and that community, um, I think my score would have reflected that I had all this opportunity, all this, all this greatness, when in reality, like we were lying about my address so that I could not have to go to the local, um, local school, which was very, very under-resourced. So I think about those students. I think about, I mean, like, I, obviously it's not perfect. And obviously there's a lot of problems here. Um, I just think about all the misreading that'll happen and folks being able to use this and point to this as like, oh yeah, even if your school, your neighborhood, wherever you came, don't worry, like the college, there's an advers adversity score, so it's okay. And that message that like, it's going to be okay because like that's factored in, but it's not really factored in, at least not fully. So I just think this is just not, I mean, it's, it's well-intentioned, but I don't think it's, it's what we need to be doing. Well, I think, folks, this is that point in the conversation where I'm going to have to take the advice of my parents. Uh, hmm. I grew up in a household with five kids, and so we got to learn the phrase, agree to disagree. Indeed. But what do you think? <laughs> because, I mean, we could go, I could go on and on about this and, you know, prove me wrong. Leave some comments. Let me know what I'm missing. Um, what do you think, especially if you are either an educator or have uh, kids coming up who are about to be applying for college? What do you think about this adversity score? I, I you know. I caution myself on being on the same side of conservatives who say this is like an attempt at affirmative action, even though it doesn't include race anyways. So I know that I, I, I acknowledge that I might be looking at this very, very wrong. This is the fact that I'm on this you know, same general side as these folks. So help me out here respectfully and kindly, please. All right, folks, next up, we have a very dope guest to help us talk about the culture of literacy. Stay tuned. There are a few things in life that we do without even thinking. We breathe, we blink, we scratch an itch, and we also read. 
all around us each day from street signs to menus at restaurants to an endless stream of social media posts and text messages. The written word literally shapes how we interact with the world, even though most of us rarely think about the actual process of reading. This is because most of us are fluent readers of language. We spend little time and almost no mental energy actually interpreting the sounds of individual letters or syllables in words. Our eyes quickly scan the symbols we see, and our brains almost instantly translate them into meaningful information for us to process the world around us. Our brains are so good at this, in fact, that we can even read stuff that doesn't actually make sense if you were to slow down and process each symbol, like this. Or this. Each of us is carrying around between our ears every day a supercomputer that has the ability to process huge amounts of information and use it to relate to other people, to make sense of complex ideas, and to make meaning of our own experience in the world. This, among many reasons, is why reading is the fundamental academic skill behind almost all learning in school. It's almost impossible to progress beyond the basics in most disciplines without the ability to read. From science to math to the arts, so much of the learning we hope for our students to access is transmitted through the written word. And it's not just knowledge that reading unlocks for us. Much of the joy of learning is stored inside of the brilliant, horizon-expanding written words of others. From a novel that made you cry, to a speech from a historical figure that you'll never forget to the secrets of the laws of motion that explain the universe. The ability to find joy and wonder in learning is largely reliant on the ability to access the genius of those who come before you in writing. With this in mind, we're going to unpack the wonder and mystery of reading and the work it takes to create a strong culture of literacy in today's schools. Schools that are often more filled with smartphones, social media, and computer screens than they are with actual books. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. I am thrilled and excited to have with us a very special guest. You have seen her before here on All the Above, uh, and that is the wonderful and talented Genevieve Dubose Akinagbe. Uh, Genevieve is a literacy coach um, at a middle school in Watts and also uh, just, I think, really a deep expert on issues of literacy and reading and creating a love of reading in our schools, which she has been working on from, uh, from sea to, si to shining sea <laughs> across this country uh, for, for more than a decade now. So um, Genevieve, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's start off with the big, uh, meaty question. Mm -hmm. Why is reading important? Oh, I'm like, why do we even have to ask that question, Jeff? <laughs> what I mean, is, what is the meaning of life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, reading is important for so many reasons. Um, I think first I always go to like a joy factor. Reading can be a really joyous experience mm -hmm. for folks, right? Um, whether I'm reading a book and I'm laughing or I'm seeing myself represented or, I have the opportunity to read a text with a, with a friend and we get to debate and talk about it. Um, it can be a really joyous experience. Um, and then there's also this notion of reading as um, a mirror and a window, right? That sometimes uh, reading a text can kind of hold a mirror up to me um, so I can see myself, see my experiences represented and um, know that whatever I'm going through, I'm not the only one, right? So it kind of creates that mirror and then it gives you a sense to look into someone else's experience, right? So um, I'm reading a book right now called Anger is a Gift by Marco Shiro. It's a, a young adult novel. And the main character is a young um, black boy in Oakland, a high schooler who is gay and also witnessed his father um, be killed at the hands of the Oakland Police Department. And um, that's not my experience, but it gives me a window into his experience. And as an educator, like thinking about all the anxiety he has and the post-traumatic stress he's experiencing, I can relate and have a sense of what some of my kids might be going through. And then I'll say one last thing is that um, like in our society, um, all of our systems, our oppressive systems are 
you know, if you don't, if you're not an avid reader or somebody who's educated about what's happening and know how to like, you know, decode and comprehend laws and amendments and that kind of thing, it's going to be hard to kind of break down those systems, right? So we have to know and like use the tools to actually shift and break down oppressive systems. So reading is important for so many reasons. Mm. Yeah. Now you work with young people from coast to coast and I'm sure they've seen you um, and your, your love of reading, I'm sure fills the room around them. What impacts have you seen reading have on young people? Yeah, um, so I think about like particular kids, like I had a student in the Bronx um, who had a, a, a kind of a difficult relationship with her mom. Mm -hmm. And um, when she was reading um, Elizabeth Acevedo's The Poet X, mm -hmm. the main character, Xiomara, has a really contentious relationship with her mom. She's really overprotective. And that student just like latched onto that book and mm -hmm. knew like, she. it gave her kind of that sense of community and belonging, but it also gave her um, like some new ideas about how to engage with her mom, right? Which is something that you can get from a book. Right. Um, I also can think of like a middle school or a sixth grader uh, at my middle school in Watts this year who joined our Project Lit Watts book club, which is just a young adult book club that we have. And she said, I'd never imagined I'd be in a place with so many other people who love books as much as I mm -hmm. do, you know? And for her, it was like just finding that community and people that she can connect with around books. So, you know, it's there's so many stories like that right. where kids can feel see themselves feel connected and, and learn about other people yeah. yeah now well i actually want to throw the same question to you because i you know as a teacher and as a social studies teacher i think um for a long time in our profession there's been the sort of uh refrain that like it's the responsibility of the english teacher mm -hmm. to, right. to teach kids to read and find love and reading and that sort of thing but I always felt very differently as a social studies mm -hmm. teacher. I'm curious to get your take. How, what yeah. do you think about this, and what impact have you seen reading have yeah. um, on young people? Well, I'll, you know, I'll admit the the advent of Common Core standards in, in teaching social science in California and the break away from the California from the CST the standardized test where they had to like answer these historical trivia questions, basically multiple choice questions. The break away from that has really helped me and a lot of teachers uh, in social science um, really like get back to the, the the importance of literacy when it comes to exploring history and thinking mm -hmm. like an historian. Mm -hmm. So I know for myself, like especially with the, the emphasis on evidence and uh, historical evidence, um, I have so many books throughout my classroom that I point to when we're, you know, something mm -hmm. as simple as we're learning about redlining in Los Angeles um, or whatever. And as I'm going through and I was looking at documents or whatever, boom, here's the color of law. Here's an entire book. We're not, you know, it's not part of my lesson today, but if you want to dig deeper into it, feel free to borrow this. And, and always I have a student, can I borrow that? And then, yeah. you know, weeks later, oh, I forgot to return. I'm still looking at it. Hey, take your time with it. Um, and just trying to do my part as a history teacher to boost or elevate the importance of reading when it comes to understanding history and the, the importance of, of, of digging beyond just like these few primary source documents or these mm -hmm. few textbook segments that we look at. So, yeah. 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 So, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways when we talk about reading in our society, right, like people, people inherently acknowledge the value of reading, but we also, uh, you know, live in this society that maybe thanks to technology today, we're more inundated perhaps with the written word via text messages, Twitter, Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, just Googling whatever interesting question you have in life and reading the <laughs> response, right? Um, we live in like a really text rich world, but at the same time we're maybe um, drifting pretty aggressively away from engaging with text primarily via books, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we're maybe reading more and then also like reading less than, <laughs> yeah, yeah. than we ever have before in, in, in history or at least in recent history. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to get your take, uh, Genevieve, like, you know, is this the, the beautiful new uh, mm. future that we're stepping into or is this like doomsday and we're rotting the minds of young people and it's all <laughs> over? Yeah, I, I don't see it as an either or, right? I see it as kind of like a both and. I'm, I'm very much a book person. Like I love physically mm -hmm. holding a book, writing in a book, um, bending pages, that kind of thing. Um, but I also really love, like if I'm listening, I was recently listening to Michelle Obama's Becoming and the audiobook. Mm -hmm. And because she reads it, it's wonderful to hear it in her voice, you know, her own story. Um, or like um, 
a really great young adult book, uh, Tomi Adeyemi's Children of Blood and Bone. The author, I mean, the actor who reads that book, ooh, it's like a movie in your uh-huh. ears. It's so good, right? And a so, movie in your ears. A movie in your yes. ears. It's amazing. <laughs> and it's like 17 hours of just goodness. It's amazing. So you guys should read it or listen to it. But um, so that for me, like technology in that way is great. But what I'm more concerned about is I feel like we do have access to so much more text and information through social media, but it's often these little snippets, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, right. oh, I got this two minute read on this or, and then people think that they they know everything about it, right? Yeah. So rather than digging deeper to go and like, like take the book from your bookshelf as a student or, yeah. you know, just do a little bit more research, I feel like that's where it gets a little bit scary to me that we have people walking around thinking, oh, I know everything there is to know about, you know, concentration camps on the border uh, versus, right. you know, actually doing mm-hmm. a little bit more research, so. It's good and bad. I don't think it's it's yeah. either or, but you know, I think it has to be like the physical books and everything that we have access to technology wise. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. funny that you mentioned that two minute read part because it's like so many articles now like tell you up yes. front how yeah. long right. like it's almost like <laughs> emphasizing that like, Oh, you can get through this in two minutes and then yeah. and then you know Don't be yeah. afraid of this article. Like, exactly. <laughs> it's not too long. Yeah. Which yeah. I will say I sometimes like because I'm like, Oh, I'm brushing my teeth. Why am I reading an article where I'm brushing my teeth? But I brush my teeth for two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it is, but I should also just be present with brushing you my should, teeth. Yes, you know? Good good dental hygiene on <laughs> yes, all the above yeah. too, folks. But I'll be like, It's two minutes, great. I want to brush my teeth for two minutes, I can read this, yeah. you know? So it's good and bad, but yeah. So you mentioned that that book club that you have uh, with youngsters. Like, there's this, you know the ongoing stereotype that young people don't like to read, young people don't want to read. There might be some teachers, unfortunately, um, out there <laughs> listening or, or viewing this. Like, oh yeah, my students don't like to read, though. Like, mm-hmm. I'll let the English teacher fight that fight, like Jeff mentioned. But like in general, they don't like to read. Does that stereotype hold true in your experience? Absolutely not. Like I, I always tell, I get kids that tell me all the time, oh, Mr. Bose, I don't like to read. Oh, I don't mm-hmm. read. I'm not a reader. And I always tell them, you just have not been paired with the right book, right? right? There is a book for you out there. You just haven't found it yet. And and just recently, uh, we have, um, to try to like build the culture of literacy and reading at our school, I was inviting, we have this gorgeous lawn that we don't use very often. And so I invited teachers to bring like blankets and, and like beach chairs. And we put them out at lunch and any kid who wanted to read just mm-hmm. in the sun or under the shade of a tree could come out and read. And one of our eighth graders uh, came out with a teacher and she didn't have a book. I was like, oh, hey, Michaela, you, do you want a book? Do you want to read? And she's like, oh, no, Miss suppose I don't read. I don't read. And I said, how is that possible? I was like, you just haven't found the right book. And I had a, a tote bag that had Langston Hughes, a picture of Langston Hughes on the side. And she was like, oh, I know Langston Hughes. And I was like, oh, what do you know about him? And she's like, oh, he wrote this really good story about this kid who stole the, tried to steal this woman's pocketbook so he could buy blue suede shoes. And she was talking about, thank you, ma'am, the short story, thank you, ma'am, which is an amazing story. She was so excited about that story. And I was like, Michaela, you clearly read because you love <laughs> Thank You, Ma'am by Langston Hughes. Yeah. And so we had a great conversation about, like, what is she into? And the next period, like 30 minutes later, I went to her science class and book talked three quick books for her based on what she said. And she chose Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give. And mm-hmm. I was like, I have a signed copy by the author for you to read, you know? And, and it's just like this idea that kids will say they don't like to read, right. but it really is our role as educators to first debunk that for them mm-hmm. and say, that's not true, but just to really work to pair them with a book that makes sense for them, you yeah. know? So yeah, it's a lie. Kids yeah. are lying to themselves or they've been lied to, <laughs> yeah. you know? We yeah. can't fall for that. So um, your response actually is making me want to almost like circle back to the question we started with Mm -hmm. uh, about why reading is important. And, you know, I guess just my own particular take on this is that so much of the joy of learning and the joy of um, of growing up and like becoming as a as a person Mm -hmm. uh, comes from connecting with the ideas of others. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we of course, we live in a very like oral culture and we tell each other stories and that's that's very important. But, you know, nobody has time to sit around and listen to someone for 17 hours, (laughs) (laughs) talk about everything they ever did. Right. Um, And so, you know, books are the way we can just throw that in our bag and carry it around with us and read for 10 minutes here and Mm -hmm. 20 minutes there and, and, and go on this journey. And, uh, and, and so that's maybe the more like, you know, engaging with a novel that really speaks to your experience. But I also think about every other aspect of school, right? And so the joy that you get when you understand um, 
you know, why if there's no gravity in space, you can't just like push the spacecraft to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Be because you learn about how physics works mm -hmm. and, um, you know, or you, you understand that inside this table are, you know, trillions of small atoms of carbon and they're vibrating and there's energy <laughs> and, and these, this is interesting stuff about yeah. life and how the world around us works. And so much of that you can't, access the interesting fun stuff if if you're not reading mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm wondering um as someone who spends a lot of time like trying to build a culture of reading um at a at a school and mm -hmm. at a middle school where kids are dealing with everything else in life at the same time yeah like in in what way i don't know do you agree and um in what way do you build that, that yeah culture? yeah i think i mean it sounds really complex but i honestly feel like it's pretty simple in terms of how you do that. Um, and I think the first step is that you have a variety of texts for students, right? So you have those really engaging informational texts about science and gravity. And then you have texts that are like culturally relevant to kids that they can see themselves in. And like, like I said, have those windows into other people's lives. And you have like not only a range of texts, but you have them at like different levels, right? So you need just good, good texts, period. That's, I think, step one. Um, but I think the factor that is like crucial is that you need adults in the space to really model what like readers do and like the excitement that you bring. So it's like I've seen schools where, you know, outside of teachers classrooms, they have these signs that say, I'm currently reading. Talk to me about this, you know, um, and where kids are, where adults are talking about the books that they're reading. And I don't mean just the ELA teachers. Right. right. I mean, everyone's talking about it. I recently saw on Twitter um, one school site had all of their staff take pictures with their favorite book, yeah. which I thought was the cutest thing ever, and I want to do it at our school this year. And, and so on their badge all year long, there was a picture of the teacher with their book or in the yearbook. You know, I just thought, like, that was really fun. And, and so it's like you need to have teachers book-talking books. Like, if you're into sports and poetry, you're going to love Kwame Alexander's The Crossover, you know? So I think building that excitement. And then, you ha like, we have to give kids time and space to talk with each other about books. Like reading is a social thing. It shouldn't be something that I'm doing by myself and I don't talk to anyone about. So how do we, or how do schools embed time in the schedule? Whether it's through a book club that's happening, whether it's through like a turn and talk, whatever it is, like there should be space for kids to talk about books. Um, and then I'd say lastly, like we have a lot of kids and I have from my experience, kids who are striving readers, right? Kids who haven't yet been able to read on grade level. Um, and so you need really trained educators in the space who know how to help those kids fill in the gaps that they're missing and so that they can, like by middle school, most kids can decode, right? But they're struggling with comprehension. So, um, so how am I as a teacher, like really equipping my kids to access those amazing texts that we have? So I think it's really around like having the right text and then generating excitement and then supporting kids, you know, um, and really making it something that's across the school versus just sits in my class as an English teacher. Yeah. Now, as we build that culture of literacy, you know, there's clearly some students that you come across who certainly identify as being readers. And, mm -hmm. and they have their head buried in a book any moment that they get. And you ask them about what they're reading, what they last read, and they could go on and on about yeah. it. But then, of course, you have your, your students who claim to not read or don't like reading, like the uh, young lady that you mentioned. Um, what do you see as the connection between a student's or a young person's identity as a reader mm -hmm. and their overall identity? Yeah, I love I love that question. That's right. like, whew, there's a lot we could talk about in that. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's really complex. And I, and I think about my kids, right? Mm -hmm. And my students who are, you know, predominantly black and brown kids and students right. who come from, you know, low income communities. And there's this whole notion in our society that like reading is like, a white thing sort of yeah. right that like oh you're you're getting good grades you're doing that and and I and I love to share with kids like like reading is like a source for your liberation right like let's talk about Frederick Douglass and like what he did how smart and savvy he was to learn to right. read and then how he used the power of the written word um, to really like make huge societal change right and so there's for me it's a lot of like that piece of for kids to see themselves right in text which for me is incredibly important and i think that's maybe because i didn't see that a lot in my own childhood right. um and i know there's lots of kids that don't and so they don't connect because they may think i'm not going to be into that book when i read catcher in the rye as a ninth grader i don't know where it came from but there was something in my mind i was like i'm not going to like that book because it's written mm. by a dead white man i remember mm. distinctly thinking that and then i loved it you know and i was like oh i actually really enjoyed this text 
but there are some kids that won't even attempt it because right. they they don't see themselves and so i think there's it's about like kind of shifting the conversation with kids around like you can be a reader and be this and be that and stay true to who you are because your story like is just as valid and should be shared you know and so yeah i think it's 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 a it's a big conversation yeah. you know yeah your your story there makes me flash back to ninth grade and now i'm forgetting her name which i feel <laughs> feel bad about because i love to give her a shout out but my ninth grade english teacher was this just kind of weird? I thought she was weird, <laughs> and she was like a very touchy feely, like herbs and crystals yeah. kind of kind of person. And I was just like, "Where herbs are you, crystals. lady?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we read. I remember starting to read *Catcher in the Rye*, mm -hmm. and at least at that time, the cover was like plain white with like some red and blue stripes on it. Or yeah, something. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. the most uninteresting right. cover of a book of right. all time right. with a title that doesn't didn't mean make anything. sense to me. I don't yeah. even know if as an adult it really makes sense <laughs> to me. And, I, and it talks about rye and I'm yeah. like who likes rye bread? Like right. this, is, right. this, is, this, is this, this book is about to be literary rye bread. Uh, <laughs> and then it was fantastic, right? Yeah. And I just, you know, connect with this character who's running around calling people phonies and stuff. <laughs> and I was like this dude keeps it real. Yeah. And so, uh, the the journey that you go through um also like trying on things that are very different uh, yeah. as a reader the mm -hmm. journey that you go on trying on things that are very different than your own experience and that wind up expanding yeah. your sense of what's possible in the world whether mm -hmm. that's a novel or whether that's you know um, a poem or a piece of music or or whatever yeah. um i think it's so uh is so critical and so I wonder, Genevieve, in this world where the, the pressure in school um, is, you know, for better or worse, in many cases, like we've got to, you know, raise achievement and raise scores and demonstrate um, growth from students. And I don't mean that those things are unimportant, mm -hmm. but where those pressures create a certain set of responses sometimes that maybe um, mm -hmm. tends to not be, let's like slow down and engage with this novel that you may or may not have on a test question ever right, right. um how do you build the you know the culture of literacy in a context uh to to do the kinds of things we were just talking about in a context where you know the bells ring in every 45 minutes yeah. and, and time is of the essence yeah no I, I struggle with that because um you know i think it's easier when you're well for me it was easier when i was a classroom teacher because i could just close my door and if no one came in my room then Oh, well, if I'm letting kids read for 20 minutes straight without any direct instruction, like, right. well, you know, like, ooh, so scary. Right. right. And so but as a literacy coach, um, like it's it's I have to I think very differently about like what I say to folks. Um, but I do believe hands down that kids need time to read in the school building, like in the school day, because you can't expect a kid to go home and read like we can ask that. But right. I can't guarantee as your teacher that that's happening. And so. For me, if I want kids to be able to analyze a complex text on a state exam or just in my room, like they need to have like a volume of reading experiences under their belt that gives them that prior knowledge about a topic that they may not be as familiar with or, you know, give them the stamina to actually like per persist and read this text that might be hard. And we build that by giving kids multiple opportunities to read multiple texts right and so it's it's um it's a fine line like it's it's uh and when you have a 50 minute period it's like am i doing it where the first 10 minutes every day is my kids reading that's their warm up and it's just quiet time to read and i can confer with kids or i'm reading too or is it like i have one day a week where you know thursdays are like our i don't know throwback relax like get your book and read you know like it depends but we, I believe very strongly that kids need time to read in the school building during the school day because they're not going to grow as readers if they're not having, you know, that opportunity. So a lot of our listeners, actually all of our listeners, um, love the importance of reading and identify it as readers mm -hmm. and want to support young people's growth <laughs> yes. as readers. Uh, yes. So what can adults do, um, you know, beso beyond the ELA teacher who's there with uh, set uh, lessons and, and books that they're uh, walking students through, what could other adults do to help support young people's love of reading? Yeah, I mean, I think if you are a parent or anyone who has kids in your world, um, it's so important to just talk about books, right? Talk about yeah. text, talk about what you read in the New York Times or the LA Times, like talk about what's happening in the world and then like go and 
research it a little bit more. Um, share your favorite books with kids. So it's like, no matter who I'm with, I, like if it's a little kid or like a teenager, mm-hmm. I'm always like, oh, what book are you reading right now? Or what's your, and then I'll share, you know, just as, a, as like a reminder and a model for them. Um, and if you're someone that doesn't have like connections with kids, I mm-hmm. think it's so important to like reach out and see what's happening in schools. Like how mm-hmm. can you support what's happening in your local neighborhood school? Like, can you donate books? Can you attend like a project lit book club meeting? Mm-hmm. You know, can you think about how you can bring your expertise in so that kids are, are expanding their knowledge of the world right. so that when they do encounter something in a text that might be confusing, they're like, oh yeah, I remember that guest speaker that came in and talked about, you know, I don't know, 3D printing, you know, and that, so just bringing our own passions, like, and recognizing that, like, public schools are of and for the public. And so even if you're not in public school, you are part of the public. So mm-hmm. how are you investing, you know, in the students who are in those schools? And how are you investing in, like, creating a society that is well-read and well-educated and, and enjoy, enjoy reading? Yeah. You know? Well, I think we're about out of time, but I do want to uh, circle back to one thing you mentioned there mm-hmm. quickly, which which people might not have caught. But you mentioned an organization called Project Lit, yep. uh, which I know you're you're very closely affiliated with. Mm-hmm. So if one of those things that people want to do to help support uh, building cultures of literacy in schools and supporting young readers, um, you know, is to is to learn more about Project Lit. Mm-hmm. How would they go about doing that? Great question. So you could so Project Lit Community. Um, you could follow us or well, them on an Instagram or Twitter. It's just Project Lit Com C O M M. But if you reach out through any of those social media forms, there are Project Lit chapters in forty eight states. So every oh, state wow. except for I think Alaska and South Dakota. So if you don't live in Alaska oh, or what's South, up, <laughs> Alaska, South Dakota, <laughs> I know. Let's get with Step it. Your game up. Step it up, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> you could Sioux reach Falls, <laughs> Anchorage, Rapid City, Get Rapid it. City. What up? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could you could reach out to there are multiple chapters across states. So and like tap in because they're community book clubs. So read with kids and talk to kids about what they're reading. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, Genevieve uh, Dubose Akinagbe, uh, our wonderful guest, thank you so much for joining us yes, again. Yes. Here are all the above. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure, pleasure to have you, and hopefully this won't be the last time. And uh, to all of our of our viewers and our listeners, thanks for joining us. Please make sure uh, you check out all of our content, including our previous interviews uh, with Genevieve on our website. That's aotashow.com. Again, that's aotashow.com. And make sure you like us, follow us, um, join the conversation on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube. All right, folks, now it's time for Class Dismissed, where, where we like to shout out people doing awesome things in the world of education. Jeff, what do we have for Class Dismissed today? Well, man, well, I have a, uh, a very heartfelt and a very serious uh, set of shout outs to give. And typically we're recognizing uh, educators. So we're recognizing yeah. teachers, principals, like frontline school staff. Right. Um, but as educators, I think we are fundamentally in the business of caring for and helping to develop young people. Indeed. And right now in this country, there's a very disturbing set of things happening down at our southern border that are not only not caring for and developing young people, but are doing active harm uh, to a large group of young people. And so for today's class, Miss, I want to give a shout out to some people who don't don't per se work in education, but are being champions for the youth, uh, for the migrant youth who've been separated from their families. So these are just a few of the organizations doing great work I want to give some props to. Um, there's the Asylum Seekers Project, um, the South Texas Pro Bono Asylum Representation Project, Raices, the CARA Project, Kids in Need of Defense, um, Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center of El Paso and the Austin Bar Association Civil Rights and Immigration Section, along with Catholic Charities and a few of the local Catholic churches down there that are doing um, important work for people who are recently released from custody. So we see you. Keep up the good work. Um, And to the children who are being detained, we have not forgotten about you. Uh, Folks, read about this. Learn about this. Let's let's do what's right by the children at the border. Indeed, and we also know there are a lot of educators out there who have gone above and beyond to make sure that their students know that they have their backs and that they're there for them. Uh, one educator who who's had a tweet that went viral, um, James Tilton, an English teacher um, out in Lancaster, he tweeted out, students, I know I've talked to some of you about this and mentioned it in class, but 
In light of recent statements from the president, it feels worth repeating. My wife and I are foster certified and have an extra room if your parents are deported or you need a place to stay. Now, James Tilton is just one of many educators out there who have offered their support in one way or another for students who, who are, are grappling with this very, very hot summer, which is hot in very many uh, in a lot of different ways. So shout out to James Tilton and all the educators out there. Again, we are just like Jeff said, we are in the business of caring for young people. And that care extends far beyond just our simple, basic content teaching that we do during uh, the school day. So shout out to James and all the other educators out there. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as always, you can find all of our content on our website. That's aotashow.com. Yep. Again, aotashow.com. And folks, it might seem like a small gesture, but every single like, every single share of a post, Indeed. every single thumbs up you give to a subscribe, video on subscribe. YouTube, on Facebook, um, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on SoundCloud, you can yeah. find all the above anywhere. Um, we are, I think, a, a unique project uh, yeah. in education. And um, part of our goal is to just spread the conversation and, and reach a wider audience. So Indeed. you can help with that. Like our stuff, share it, subscribe. Every little gesture helps uh, more than you even know. So thank you, and we'll see you next time. Indeed.